So it's my pleasure and honor to introduce Paul Dayton. Uh, I met Paul uh, playing pickup basketball. President Barack Obama said that one of the best ways to judge a person's character is to play basketball with them. And uh, Paul is, I mean, I've never met anyone so friendly on a, on a basketball court. Like, he will dunk on me and then, and then, like, I feel good about it. Like, oh, <laughs> that nice guy just dunked on me. Uh, and it's just, just uh, one of the friendliest people you will meet. Uh, he also is a champion boxer, author, speaker, person. And uh, with that, Paul. Thank you, Mr. Norman. Um, I'm very, very um, happy uh, to be here. Um, this has actually been on my radar for quite a while. Um, you see, I have a son, Dane, who, uh, class of uh, 2015, and he's now a junior in uh, San Diego State, studying a business major in business entrepreneurship, and um, he's thriving, and a lot of that, what I give credit to, is his, his journey here at the whole Hawaii Country Day of school. So I'm one of these individuals that, you know, why am I here? Um, what do I want to achieve out of this? Um, uh, what this is all about is uh, my most important uh, speaking that I'll ever do is always to the youth. And it's for a lot of reasons. Um, first off, um, I was your age before. And, and because of that, places that you are, where you stand, or what you're currently enduring in your life, uh, what you're uh, capturing, what you're achieving, um, what you're encountering. Um, I've probably ran laps or doing it. And because of that, I think it's always good uh, to kind of uh, come together, um, hear a message, and um, my goal is always to give people higher hope. Um, let them have a believability um, that they can succeed, um, that they can overcome uh, potentially uh, uh, situations that they see right now being insurmountable, um, being mountainous, or what have you, um, that if they're doing great, that they can understand they can be even greater. Um, as Mr. Norland said, I'm a, a, a retired world boxing champion. Um, but as I started to delve into going into that journey, um, I started to understand that there was a, a bigger world, a bigger purpose for me. And um, I'm very thankful that I, I went through the boxing to find that out because it gave me the, the, the tools um, to take on what I needed to. So um, how many of you in here uh, currently uh, uh, know what you want to be when you grow up? <laughs> right, so <sorry>. it's. <laughs> I'm a dunk on you. <laughs> Again? <laughs> but to be very friendly. <laughs> well, at the age of four, four years old, I knew what I wanted to be. Um, and I knew what I wanted to do. Um, I saw a man on TV. Uh, by the name of uh, Mr. Muhammad Ali. And, and the sight of seeing him uh, was equivalent uh, to seeing a superhero when I saw him. Um, I got into boxing. Um, I was never an aggressive kid. Uh, I, I mean, I, I was a mama's boy. Um, I'm 50 and I'm still a mama's boy. <laughs> Um, so if you really thought out my, my plan, people say, oh yeah, I saw him, he was going to be a boxer. I would not be the person that you would, that you would think. And I'll explain the reasons why, why I box. Um, so at four years old, I saw Muhammad Ali, and um, I wanted to be him. Um, I wanted to, every time I would uh, see him, I would totally get animated. I would totally mimic what he was doing. And like I said, I wanted to become a world champion. 
I got started on the process, the journey, uh, at eight years old. And let me say this, when I said I wanted to be a world boxing champion, become a world boxing champion, I didn't even know you made money. <laughs> so that kind of shows you how genuine uh, my goal was. I mean, there was no economic incentive. I understood uh, uh, the rare rarity as far as achieving the achievement, um, but I didn't even know you made money. And however, I, I never had a trophy before at the time, and that looked pretty cool. And I thought that would be cool. And so the summer of 1976, oh gosh, <laughs> summer of 1976, um, I started boxing and I trained hard. And that goal for getting that first trophy. And I, <laughs> I worked out, did turn no corners. I mean, I did everything extra. And so I had my first match and I boxed an individual by his name, I'll never forget his name, Todd Dozier. He was a couple years older than me, had a lot more experience than me, but I had sparred against him and I had done well. So um, here I have this opportunity to uh, win my first uh, trophy. Um, I thought I did a number one tie. I uh, did very well. Uh, we come to the center of the ring and they make the announcement. I'm waiting for them to say Paul Maiden and they said the winner is Todd Dozier. And I was heartbroken. Immediately, I was like, like, where's my trophy? I worked hard. I did everything that you're supposed to do. I didn't, you know, I didn't cheat. I, you know, all these things would come to mind. And I cried, of course. Now, let me add insult to uh, the situation. Um, here I was, like I said, at four years old, wanted to be this world boxing champion. Uh, wanted to put all the work in. Um, my, my um, you know, everything about it. Win this first trophy. I had a brother, I have a brother, but my brother at the time was five years old. And my little brother boxed only because he had no aspirations to be a champion, had no aspirations, didn't want to put in the work, whatever. The only reason why he boxed was because he wanted, had to be around his big brother, you know. He actually won. <laughs> he won a trophy. So imagine this, here's this guy who had this, uh, forecast of walking in his home where where this trophy was going to be placed in this made up trophy case part of the of the house, the structure of the house was going to be mine. And now when I walk through a house and I would go get a glass of water where I, I'd see a trophy. But it wasn't my trophy. It was my little five year old brother who had no aspirations of being this champion, had no aspirations of doing anything with it. Like I said, he was just kind of there. It's always funny, but the one thing that I always like to stress to people is, although I was hurt, although I was upset, although I thought I had been wronged, that was a Saturday afternoon when it happened, I could not wait, could not wait until Monday came around. And the reason why I couldn't wait till Monday came around was because I wanted to get back in the gym. I wanted to start working get back at one and work towards obtaining that first trophy. And I did. I was hurt, like I said, and I worked hard and I worked even harder um, for that first trophy. And it would be a month later, I would obtain that first trophy. And um, I've been blessed to win easily, easily over a thousand, as an amateur, a thousand trophies, plaques, awards, and what have you. To this day, there's only one trophy that I have. Um, actually, my son has it. Um, I gave it to him. It was that first trophy of 1976, the month of October. And it's that one. It's this little red, white, and blue trophy with a boxing pose like this. It's pretty cool. Um, but it gave me that, um, well, it said a lot of things. It said, first off, I was not going to say, oh, I did all I could. I'm done. Now we're going to learn how to become a world champion and shoot marbles. I was going to stay the course or whatever, direct, you know, I was going to change my direction, divert away from my goal because I had lost. So that was my test. And, and for me, I always think it's important to understand that sometimes 
what you think is your time sometimes isn't your time. There's a, there's a better part of your script. Your script becomes more triumphant because you'll be able to tell a story about, oh gosh, it didn't start off this way. Here's this guy who wanted to become this champion of the world or whatever, and I didn't get that first trophy. I had to already endure uh, certain challenges about finding out about myself that it's, it's not going to be handed to me like that. What was my attitude going to be like? Was I going to now be uh, an individual who wasn't going to be coachable because I had already done everything that they had asked of me? No. I understood, although I was hurt, emotionally hurt, um, that I was going to have to weather the storm. Weather the storm and like I said, get back at one. And I did. I would go on to have a, a very uh, decorated um, amateur uh, career. I have one of the highest um, winning percentages um, in amateur boxing history, which was uh, 327 wins and, and 10 losses. Um, I had the opportunity, I won several uh, national and international uh, titles as an amateur. Um, I got to travel the world. I got to travel the world, and which to me was really cool because I grew up um, Pretty much, I mean, we grew up uh, poor, but um, enriched with love and, and a lot of support. Um, but it gave me the opportunity to be enriched with understanding and learning different cultures and, and getting to know people and, and adapting. And I basically put that within the structure, uh, the framework of what I wanted to be as, as a person. Learning not only how to uh, deal with styles in the ring, which I did, but also how to deal with styles in life of people and how to adjust, how to adapt, and, and how to, um, instead of see the difference, but to embrace the uniqueness. So what people see as different, he or she is different, I like to see what's unique, what's unique about it, um, you know, and in, in pretty much everything. You go, gosh, how do you do that? Mr. Norman, he won't say this, he has a set shot that he does, he shoots it and he's gonna laugh at me, but it's true. He shoots it from far, the first time I met him, I go, God, I go, what are you, oh, great shot. <laughs> you know, it's like you go, what are you, oh, went in, great shot. And he sits there and you think he's not, and he always lures me into this, I, you think he's not gonna shoot, but now I know him. But he, it, when you first meet someone, I wasn't like, you know, I said, okay, that's pretty cool. Now I can't do that. So instead of saying it's different, I find what's unique about it, because I can't do it. I can't do it like that. Embracing the uniqueness in it, we all have it. And that's how we become enriched. Um, being a boxer, um, like I said, it was, it was important to me that I, The boxing pundits thought that I was too nice. They said I smiled too much. Uh, that I wasn't nasty. All the things that you needed to be a contender, let alone a champion. Oh, he's talented. They so said he's very talented, but he's too nice. He, and, you know, he's going to get in uh, uh, the trenches, and because he's so nice, he's not going to be able to go to that next level. Um, and in boxing, you have to be mean. This is what they're saying. You have to be nasty. You, you, you can't, you have to be like so-and-so and so-and-so. And so. so that only gave me more of a drive to be a kind person, you know? It was important for me that I was a nice person. In school, I mean, I started boxing like I was eight years old. You never saw me using what I could do in the ring. I mean, I've never been in an altercation. I mean, uh, on someone else, and, and, and I was always trying to prevent potential conflict or, or things like that. Being a leader, it was important um, that I use my own mind, not be lured away from the style. I was known as a boxer, counterpuncher, speed, foot movement. Um, I wasn't known as a brawler, so I kind of used that same structure as far as the way I live life. My parents. Uh, taught me a certain way to be the people, be kind to people, and because of that, it was important that I maintain that even without the supervision. You're always being interviewed. You hear me say that a couple of times. You're always being interviewed. And when you don't have supervision, be it your parents, 
be it your teachers, be it your coaches, that's when things come to light. You know, when your parents are, when you're away from your parents, are you being obedient? Are you being courteous? Are you being kind? Are you following the path that you're being taught? When you're around, when you're away from your teachers, are you studying? Are you really studying? Are you really taking in what they're telling you? When you're away from your coaches, are you practicing? Are you, are you, are you, are you listening? Are you in training? even when you're not in physical training, focusing in, not just being there, are you really, really there? And so it was important when I was being interviewed, as I like to say, that I was all into everything. So you, you're, you're, it was important that you see me being like this person, sunny and smiling and, 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 and optimistic and, and about people, and then you see me out somewhere else and, I'm demonstrative in a whole negative fashion. You're always being interviewed. And the reason why that's as important and as it is to the youth is because, and no, not to you, everyone. Um, you never know. You never know how that comes back. You never know that the time that you want to be lured into a negative action, a negative act, or being mean to someone, that that individual, you might be out at a mall, you might be at an outing, you're doing something in some form of negative display or being lured into it, that may be the time that you might be interviewing for an internship or a job or, or your child might be uh, you know, in need of something. And people are going to recollect that. They go, oh yeah, that was a person that, along with other people, that was doing this, this, and that. And that sometimes are separators. That's how I call separators and people make decisions. People have my late father used to always say, used to have a, there's so much talent in this world. And sometimes the separators are how you treat people and what you are willing to do for people. The separator sometimes is how you choose to be the leader and not be led by getting into, like I said, negative acts, where then you have to, you have to work yourself out of those, those consequences. And then, like I said, being positive is sometimes that person can look and say, yeah, I remember that individual. He or she was out, but I saw them with other people, and, and for whatever wrong reason, I saw them being a leader. They weren't the ones that was doing that. I saw them actually trying to stop them. The separators. I just never wanted to be um, defined as just an athlete. I never wanted to be defined as this world champion boxer. As I started to get closer, as I said, to the goal, um, things came to light where there was, like I said, the bigger purpose, bigger than being, being, being a boxer. It had to be about the being, the individual. What was I doing? How was I helping human life? How was I um, giving of what I do, my gifts? You know, um, What was I doing with my gift? Being a world champion is cool, but what am I doing with it? How am I helping others? You know, I can't tell you how many people that once they get that, that shine, they forget. They don't have time. You know, and the people that I actually have followed, my superheroes as they say, um, are the individuals that were about the world, about helping people, uplifting people. Um, once again, back to that level of higher hope. Because sometimes we get doused in so much negativity, haterade as I call it, um, people trying to drown you as far as so you can't achieve. They tell, they're telling you what you can't do. Are oh, you going to try that? Do you know how many people want to do this? How many people want to do that? I can't tell you how many people used to tell me, why do you get up at 4 a.m. in the morning and run? Why? What's the difference? You can get up at 5, 6, 7, even 8 o'clock. It's the same distance. And I used to always say, no, it isn't. I want to do things when it's supposedly inconvenient. Because that's when the test takes place. When things are inconvenient, that's when I want to do it. When I, after I worked hard the night before in boxing or whatever I was doing, it could be anything, that next morning is the test. 4 a.m., that alarm clock goes off and I wake up and I go, oh, no. And then you look and you go, okay, here's the test. That is, someone else is getting up. It becomes a game within the game, mentally. So. 
the when it's inconvenient is when I want to be doing it because that's when you start getting that extra credit. Never been, um, never in my life, I've never had a drink, alcoholic drink, I've never, never smoked, never really, I once again, it was so important that I didn't let the term, well, everyone's doing whatever. Just didn't want that. I didn't want um, to be lured out of my style the way I was, the way I was projected to be, or the way I was um, brought up to be. So, um, and, and listen, I had to endure some uh, tough circumstances, like everyone does. You know, when my parents, my parents divorced in high school when I was in 15, and that was a pretty tough deal. You know, it's like you kind of see something, you know. That's normal. You see, you're used to seeing something. Now it's kind of fractured, so to speak. You come home and you go, okay, it's okay, so it's not, you know. It, and it took a while for me to adjust to, but once again, back to the test. Is, am I going to let this um, get me away from where I'm trying to go? Is this the test that's going to allow me to surrender and, and lose hope and think that I'm not going to be able to get to that level, that achievement of being being that champion. And I did. I mean, eventually, like I said, as hard as it was, um, I had to understand that there's, there's a reason um, that I'm loved and also that I must go on and, and, and get to my goal. Um, I would lose my father uh, three days before my uh, uh, 11th pro match. And uh, that was a real difficult. I lost him to a heart attack. And, my father was very, very supportive of my career. I mean, he was uh, uh, very much in my life, so that was a very tough deal. However, um, I knew that my father uh, would want me to box and not cancel um, the situation, and I did uh, perform and won and, and then grieved afterwards. <coughs> but I also used it as a, another form of inspiration to make sure that I fulfilled the goal of becoming that, that world champion that I used to tell him I was going to be and that he supported me to be. So there, you know, there, we all deal, um, you know, life is going to happen and, and as life happens, we encounter a lot of things at all ages. Um, we encounter new challenges, uh, we encounter new ways um, and to get to where we need to go. And, and because of that, um, these tests that come along we have to make sure that we stay the course, uh, that we, we stay upright, we stay positive, and we understand that through whatever we're in, enduring or encountering during that current time that is, would be specified as dark, uh, that we understand that if we keep chipping away and if, and if we keep uh, being repetitive about the process and, and respect the process, and believe in the process, uh, that sunshine is a lot closer than you think. Um, I had a, a situation in 1999, which was my most uh, uh, challenging uh, part of my life that I've ever had to deal with. Um, I uh, would uh, lose a cousin uh, who had just turned 21 uh, to suicide. Uh, his father, uh, my uncle, um, would follow up seven months later with the same act. Um, and then my, uh, my uh, so that was January 3rd, <coughs> August 9th, and then November 20th, I would win my third title. Um, and I would oppose an individual uh, who I would um, knock out in the 10th round, and he would never regain consciousness, and he would die 15 days later. Uh, anyone who knows me uh, knows that if anything was going to create, create my exit, uh, as a boxer, as a performer in the ring, um, it would be that. Um, but what happened for a while, not only did it do that, it created my exit from, from life for, um, for quite a while. Um, I felt a lot of guilt. Um, I was emotionally torn. Um, there was just a lot going on. And I actually, to be honest, I thought I was about uh, going to be paid back. I thought I was going to die. I was scared to live, scared to... Uh, to breathe. Um, I was married. I, uh, my son Dane was just about to turn three, so I had to work my way back. And my son, I always credit my son is the reason 
why I'm standing here before you so strong because uh, it was important for me that he was able to read following chapters of my life. Um, it was important that he was able to understand um, what his dad went through, but also how he got through and got to got to things back at one. And, and not only um, as a boxer, but as a being, as a, what was he able to, I, I just didn't want my son to have to hear um, people say, oh, it's a shame what happened to your dad, and then it, there's no there's no next layers of any things that I was doing in the positive sense. It means that I became paralyzed, in which I was for a time. But I worked my way back, and, and because I did, um, I'm here. And, and because I'm here, um, I feel that it's important that I that I that I talk to people and give people my recipes. I call them winning recipes, and, and I don't have all the answers. And I don't have it all together. Uh, but the beauty is, is I have gone through things. And when you go through things and you hear things, you can kind of, you, you can make them relative. You go, hey, I didn't box. I don't know anything about boxing. But hey, I did have to do this. And I do remember when this person, uh, you know, did this to me. And I, I kind of, you know, and you kind of put it, you start to piece your life together. And you start to make sense of it. And, and I, I love hearing stories. And it's like when I hear stories about other people, I read it go, Okay, I, there's no commonality is from a standpoint of what we do, but it's life. And how that person was able to um, rise above what they had to uh, endure and, and get through it, um, to me it's always beneficial. Um, being a sponge has always been important to me. Under, you know, I was always that kid who was in the house listening to whomever had something to share that could help me get to where I needed to go in the course, which like I said, being becoming a world champion. I had to know. I had to be there. I had to listen. Even as a, like I said, I was very coachable because I wanted to become better. And, and I had this, I know, know nothing, I know nothing, teach me everything attitude, I still do. Um, there's so much I don't know, and that's actually a beautiful thing because that means there's still room to grow. And you know, it's just it's just a beautiful thing to um, know that I was in a place at a certain part of my life where I had to um, get through a storm when I didn't think it was going to be possible. And because I got through that storm, I was able to tell a story that would become a published book that is now a award-winning documentary short film, and there's so many other things that's, because uh, my work's still not done. So, but at the end of the day, the most important element that I take is that I have to be nice. That it doesn't cost anything to be a nice person. I mean, nothing. It's like, literally, it doesn't cost a penny to be a nice person. I had a conversation with someone before, this individual, an adult, and she said, she goes, oh, you shouldn't have to work uh, um, to be nice. And I was like, yeah, you should. If you want to be a greater person, I mean, yeah, I can be nice, but I can be even nicer. Just like I, as an athlete, I can be a greater athlete. I can run faster. I can jump higher. I mean, I can, my hands, you know, my hand speed, my power, whatever, my combinations come together better. Why can't I be a nicer person? I mean, why, why can't I put in the work <clears throat> to become a nicer person? When I became champion of the world, it was important that I became a nicer person. And the reason why, like I said, because my um, education was the people I had watched amass some shine, some achievements, I saw them become aloof, and I saw them um, dismiss others. I saw them just not have time, and I saw them become even rude. And I remember I kept saying, when I become champion, I'm not going to be that way. I'm going to be nice. I'm going to be approachable. I'm going to be there for people. People will call me, and they will not believe that it's me talking to them. I will come to the gym and talk, and, and, and you know, a kid who needs help on a certain adjustment or combination or whatever, I will not only, uh, I will come and show them that was important. It was important. So 
in the process of becoming nicer, I, I'm, like I said, I'm 50, I'm still trying ways to be nice, to be there, to be that go-to person, someone that you can depend on, someone that you go, oh, gosh, I was there this day, April 16th, this individual, I was going through, I was having a hard day, or I was dealing with this, and this individual told me something about what they dealt with, how they got over, and how they're still getting over. And I always say this, I believe, and this happens all the time, that someone in here is going to approach me and say that they were here April 16, 2018, and heard the message, heard the words, uh, heard the, the, the situations, and how the person was able to persevere, uh, weather, um, and, and become even stronger and how they were able to relate it, put it within the structure of their life, and how they are now in a champion in their life, and how they're doing, and their they're shine, their swag, and what have you. And I really believe that day is going to happen. Someone's going to come to me, email me, or whatever, and I am going to be so happy about that because that's what life is all about to me. It's about uh, giving, giving back, and then seeing others succeed. So. Um, Pretty much that's uh, pretty much what I wanted to say. Remember, like I said, it costs nothing to be nice. It costs nothing to be there for other people. It costs nothing to tell people no to doing negative actions. It costs nothing to be a leader other than hard work, dedication, and that's pretty much it. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Any questions? Don't get scared. Don't get scared. Well, how did boxing change you? I mean, it's a particular sport. It is a violent sport. I mean, you're going on. But when you look back on it, did the sport change you, or did you try to change the sport? So I tried to change the sport. How it helped me was it, it caused me to, a, a, like I said, adapt to styles. So it was important that I use boxing as a vehicle to the places that I want, where I wanted to go. I wanted to be champion, but there's other things I wanted to do. Um, but I also didn't want you to, like, if you didn't know who I was, that you would never know that I was a boxer, let alone an athlete. You go, gosh, because I, I believe I can be anything. And boxing helped me that because it gave me all the intangibles that I make use of today. Discipline, which is like no other. Um, the ability to adapt, strategic, um, the endurance aspect of it, there, um, the, the respect for repetition. Um, so, I tried to change boxing as far as that, but it's not going to happen because it has that, you know, that tradition. But it changed me because I was able to kind of trick it out and, and, and make it the way, make it work for me, and make it work for what I'm doing today. So, that's pretty much, yeah. Yes? You talked a little bit about your mom and your dad as being mentors for you wondering who else in your life uh, proved to be really important mentors that you find your yourself emulating and your your relationships with other people yeah Muhammad Ali first off just like it's like having so I got an opportunity to, uh, as I start to turn you on I meet, uh, Mr. Ali during the course of a few times um, there's individuals that um, I move I had to make um, I had moments in my life where I had to make moves like so I had to move to the state of Washington there was an individual, the person that I told you, who's my uncle, who um, is no longer here. I mean, he gave me an opening to live out in Puyallup, Washington, and where I was able to then really take my career to another level. And he challenged me, um, asking me, do you want to go to the Olympics? Do you, you know, and he said, hey, move out here. And I went there, with, went to Washington with $99 to my name and a lot of faith. And um, I did, and because I did, because I went through with it, um, I had no ranking, nothing, and if I had not did that, I wouldn't become have become that world champion. So, well, my uncle Ron, and he wasn't even my uncle. So I have this term: just because you're not my blood doesn't mean you can't be treated as such, or I be treated. So um, I would just send them in there in the UK right now. Well, the the son is in the UK, and I uh, I sent them a message. I said it's been 30 years, 30 years since I became a. I just sent it this morning. 30 years since I became a member of the family. And so we kind of we joke back and forth about it, but 30 years, so that's 30 years ago, I made that choice. And because I made that choice to try to better myself, but not only better myself, to challenge myself against the ropes, against all odds. And because I did that, 
once again, I'm hearing all those other things that have happened. So my Uncle Ron, um, there's the people today that I, that I have, that I, that I look to, that I'm, I'm always trying to be nourished by knowledge and how can I take it up a step. I have this term called thriller. I'm always reaching for thriller. So I mean, thriller is such a level that it's, it doesn't seem to be attainable. And, and when you get there, then you gotta take it up another notch. So, so I have a, a few, few of mentors. Yes? Do you have any advice for teachers and coaches in kind of fostering these values that you're talking about? Yeah, I, I think sometimes it's, it's like, I, I, it's a conversation. Like this to me is a conversation. So I don't, I don't talk at, I talk with, or there's a, so sometimes each project or each individual, you never know what the individual is enduring. I've had this talk, I was talking to the US team, um, the coaches, um, few months ago about, and they were telling me about, you know, the 12 individuals. And I says, well, the 12 individuals, that's exactly what they are. They're individuals. And they're all, you don't know what's going on. So maybe, you know, understand it's a case-by-case -case situation. It's not like all, everyone having, you know, <clears throat> to me it's like having a, a conversation is, is, and, and understanding, because you don't know what that person is enduring. That person might be having something going on in the family. That person might um, feel shy about, um, you know, there might be more in, and I always call it, they might stay in the back of the kickball line. And what I mean by that is, uh, once you, you, you send someone in a place of embarrassment or whatever, they stay, they remain back in the kickball line, they let you go up next. You go, no, you go up. No, no, you go up, you go up, you go up, and you go up, and they never come back up. And sometimes through conversation, we find out about other people. You go, gosh, I didn't know that. And then you have that com conversation saying, coming to a common ground, well, well, you ever thought about trying this? So you kind of adjust, and then you adapt. And then, once again, the whole goal is always overcome. So just have the conversation, as opposed to being directive and um, putting, I'm one of you. That I'm having this conversation, is that whatever? But I'm one of you. I'm still trying. Um, to maintain and overcome. I'm still doing it. So um, to have those conversations. Yes? Um, I saw you be inducted into the uh, San Diego Hall of Champions. I was there that night, so thanks for being here um, today. Um, I, f I fought for the University of Nevada uh, nice. from 1979 to 1983. Nice. As a successful football player, I went to college on a track scholarship, was successful there, but boxing, was the hardest sport I ever did. The, the training was the toughest training I've ever done, and the the nerves, I don't have to tell you, but before each match were, were the worst of any sport I've, I've ever played. Um, and obviously it's a very physical sport. Yes. Um, and I think that the learning curve, and, and I'm not talking about learning boxing, but the learning to pay attention, mm -hmm. strategy, mm -hmm. to stay calm under, Right. You know, direct. the learning curve was so much faster than in other sports because, quite frankly, you got hit in the head if you didn't do if you didn't do something right. correctly. Um, there was a real physicality to it. I've been coaching now for 34 years, um, and it seems that where when I started coaching, physicality was something to be esteemed. That physicality is being taken out of sports. Right. Not only football, but really in soccer and Everything. lacrosse, and the, you know what used to be three years ago was a good lacrosse play is now a penalty. Right. Physicality is being taken out of sport. Right. Um, I knew Dane, of course, when he was in school here. Yeah. Um, he he was not a, a boxer. Right. Correct. No. W would would you would you let your son box if he wanted to to be a fighter? If you and wanted to. If you wanted to. If yeah. your son came to you and said, "Dad, I want to be a I want to be a boxer." Would you would you allow that to happen or not? No. And what you know what what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah, that's the one. <laughs> so everyone has their dreams and their their you know their script and whatever. The one script that I can tell you that I would immediately be executive producer if my son ever came to me and said, Dad, I want a box. As a matter of fact, we've had this conversation with him. So I when Dane was a baby, from the time he was little, I would take it, you know, I'd pick him up and I would turn his hands over and stretch out his arms and I'd teach him the uppercut and come over and roll out and all these things and 
periodically we would go through as he got older, we would, you know, and put on the mitts, folks' pads, and, and work on them with different things. But I, I did that just for, for uh, to compliment other athletics, for confidence, um, for just other things. So, um, but however, if he ever came to me to ask me to box, the answer would be absolutely no. I mean, he, no way. Um, first off, I could not, it, it would, it would torture me just by, you know, um, Dane is 21, but I still, unfortunately, I, he's four to me still, so it's, <laughs> so, but, um, no, I, I would not allow him to see it. There's just so much uh, that you have to go through, and, and I would not want him to go through that level of, uh, of training, and like you said, just the, the repercussions of if he didn't do certain things, um, I always made myself conscious of, of stuff. I, I watched it one time, he was in lacrosse, and you know, when kids, sometimes life, you watch them and I go, oh my gosh, he's about, you know, it's like, because I paid attention to not only the shots I was throwing and whatever, but I also guesstimated what you were going to do. So my shots were gonna make you react, and I was all not only ready to throw combinations, but I was all ready to move back and make you miss as well, and then come back with, you know, my barrage or whatever. And there, I, I just, I could not, and not only that, even the hard work that they're boxing. So the, the answer would be, it's always been, and I'm always asked that, um, it would be absolutely no, that one wouldn't happen. <laughs> yes? Most, most people uh, are not as nice as you. <laughs> um, you know, and that's, that's not necessarily a criticism of most yeah. people. Um, but I'm curious why you think that is, and what do you think we can do about it? Why people aren't nice, why? or why people aren't as nice as people. It's interesting. It's it's. it's <laughs> I'll give you a perfect example. I, I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one, uh, consulting. I do a lot of corporate consulting, and so um, confidential stuff. But I I had a situation one time. I'll never forget this. <coughs> the individual was telling me about this individual who was a problem and was doing you know whatever. So I heard heard the process and then I said okay so I made the suggestions now I kept hearing for weeks about this individual weeks about this individual you know not doing this and that so finally I don't know after a couple of months I says hey what's going on with you know the individual oh they're doing great they're doing this this and that whatever blah, blah, blah. you know they're it's going great really turn around thank you know you know thank you I said oh I go what did you uh, I said, so what did you say to the individual about, you know, the changes and the improvements and whatever? What, and the individual said, said, I didn't say anything. And I said, really? And I go, can I ask why not? And he says, well, I don't want her to get a big head or get, a, you know, a big head and this and that and whatever. I said, well, that's interesting. I go, so, but you had no problem <laughs> if here she's not doing well, and you're just, once again, you're not looking saying, okay, is there something else going on? Is there a reason why that she might, and maybe something going on somewhere else that has nothing to do with this, where it's, you know, where it's relative to it, to just say, hey, I noticed that you're, you're, you've really stepped it up, and I noticed that you're doing this, 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 and this. You know, um, and, and keep it up. Whatever you're doing, keep it up. To make that person leave and go, wow, I feel good about myself. And not only that, I'm going to be even better. So people don't, for whatever rhyme or reason, they, they kind of want to not tell someone because they have this thought process of, oh, he or she is going to get a big head. And if I say something nice or if I am nice, that person is going to then make, use me, and, and, you know, so to speak, or whatever. And I'm willing to lay it on the line, and, and, and if I'm going to be clown used or whatever, then so be it. The intention is, and the spirit of what uh, I do is what it's about. And it's not about how I'm being used, it's about me being used to help someone else overcome, and once again, give them a level of higher hope. So it's not really about me, I remove myself, I understand I'm the instrument, but helping the other person soar is the total intention. And sometimes you have to tell, I remember the great trainer, um, boxing trainer, Angelo Dundee, used to tell Muhammad Ali would never throw left hooks, never. He would never throw left hooks. But 
Angela Dundee would come in sparring, he would say, gosh, that was an amazing left hook you just, that I saw you throwing, amazing left hook. And realistically, Ali didn't throw a left hook at all. But because of the psychology of, the, of, of what Angelo Dundee was saying to him, when the next round ensued, guess what Ali was doing? Throwing left hooks. Because he received positive enforcement, he was infused with positivity of something that he didn't even do, but because he was told something, when the next, when the bell tired or not, he was throwing left hooks. So I think that's what it is. We're, we're not telling people, we're not infusing people with um, positive fuel. We're, 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 we're more apt to let them know what they're not as opposed to what they are. Yes. I, I gotta ask one last question sure. here for you. From, as someone who has spent a lot of time in the ring, mm -hmm. and there have been, you know, boxing is, is a, it's really been a big part of our storytelling culture uh, in American yeah. culture. There have been a lot of great movies. What do you think, what is the movie that you point to that really show, you know, really, really gets at what it feels like to be the boxer, to be in the ring there? Wow. So, the movie, what it feels like. Uh, so if you were to ask my favorite movie, uh, obviously it's Rocky, even though it's not real. Uh, and I'm not, and so I'm one of those guys, I'm not a boxing snob, so I, I love boxing movies. I mean, I watch, I mean, um, it would be, wow, that's a very good question. Because Rocky's not, uh, I, and it's funny, I started boxing a year before Rocky came out, um, the first one. I mean, it would have to be one of the, uh, what about Raging Bull? See, Raging Bull was ahead of my time, and I wasn't ready for Raging Bull. Everyone says it's like the best, not only the best sports movie, they say it's the best movie, but at the age when I started watching it, truthfully, I didn't understand a lot of it. You know what I mean? I was too young. Mm -hmm. Like, I didn't understand, I'll just say it, I didn't understand a lot of the things that was going on. But everyone says that Raging Bull. Just for the sensation of being in the ring. Yeah. The filming was, I mean, was great, and, and, and I guess the transformation of, of like what De Niro mm -hmm. to lose the, the uh, to gain the weight to whatever. And like an individual like myself, I would lose thirty to thirty-five pounds per fight in thirty days, and I would put so the the transformation to do. I mean, eating and drinking once a day, mind you, for thirty days consecutively. So it's not you know, it's not like a eating a lean cuisine, the same thing, all, and and, uh, and an orange soy. Uh, for 30 days exactly, and then lose 30 to 35 pounds, I mean, and, and, and be ready. And um, the transformation, it would be rageable. It would be, yeah, it would be that. Yeah. I mean, Ali was a great movie, but... Um, Cinderella Man. Cinderella was a great yeah. movie. Oh, yeah. Great movie. Great movie. So, actually, these answers are all wrong. <laughs> the correct answer is Baden versus. Oh, you're good. You're too good. Paul, the ultimate... By no fault of his own, this is the label that he's been given. And people can so casually describe him as the killer. There's a bond that develops that is difficult to describe but impossible to miss when you are beating a man up badly. Somewhere in your heart you know that that could be you. Death was becoming, this, this was becoming too easy now. You know, back to back to back. I was fighting to live. I wanted to live. Thank you very much for, ah, for coming you. in. Seriously. Really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure.